Astronomy Cast, episode 252 for Monday, February 13th, 2012. Heisenberg's Uncertainty Principle. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? I'm doing really well. Uh, working back into our schedule, trying to catch up. We're actually recording this a little bit early than, uh, than the actual Monday, so I think we're, we're getting back on track. Again, uh, if, if you don't know, for those of you who only listen to the podcast, we record these now as live Google Plus Hangouts every Monday at uh, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, and uh, 8 o'clock uh, London time. So if you want, you can join us live. You can uh, jump into the podcast at the end and ask us questions, and we hang out for about half an hour after we record the the audio. So it's, it's pretty cool, pretty fun, really neat way to connect with us. And you guys get to pick Pamela's brains to ask her any question and see just how super smart she is. Any astronomy question. <laughs> any question. Any question you like. Whatever. <laughs> Uh, the more math, the better. So, uh, all right. Well, let's get on, let's get on with today's show. So, uh, so quantum theory is plenty strange, but one of the strangest discoveries is the realization that there's a limit to how much you can measure at any one time. This was famously described by Werner Heisenberg with his uncertainty principle: how you can never know both the position and the motion of a particle at the same time. All right, Pamela. So, I guess we we need to sort of reflect back to our uncertainty principle or I guess our, our quantum mechanics uh, conversations. So yeah. what is the sort of, what is the, the sequence of discoveries in quantum theory that led up to Heisenberg making this, this very famous uh, uh, principle? So th this is actually based on the realization that things, particles in fact, aren't simply little discrete bundles of matter that fly around like little tiny ping pong balls, but they're actually made up of waves. And so when I'm talking about a photon of light, I'm talking about something that has a wavelength that gets diffracted and interacts with the material around it in much the same way that Ocean waves will interact with seawalls as they pass through them, and waves will interact with one another in water, uh, creating dead places and places with particularly high waves. This realization that particle is also particles are also waves at the exact same time meant that suddenly, in trying to describe what does it mean for something to have a location. Um, the world kind of fell apart mathematically and we had to rethink everything. It was no longer um, a particle that has an edge here and an edge here and this radius going off from the center in both directions. Um, suddenly it became we're going to combine wavelengths of various sizes to build up a particle and that's a much different thing to try and deal with. So is that kind of like asking, like, what is the position of a wave? I mean, you can imagine a wave crashing on the beach, or, or imagine a tsunami, right? That, right. That causes this huge ocean wave that ripples across the whole ocean. And, you know, five hours later, you can ask yourself, well, where is the wave? Well, how much wave? At which place? Yeah. There's going to be some wave. You know, what's the height of the wave? What's the power of the wave? You know, right. almost the entire ocean at that point. Right, and, and so you, you do have this problem of just definitionally, what, what do you use? And you can, with, with particles, you can start to say, well, a, a electron is made up of this vast combination of wavelengths that all interfere to localize the particle in one place. Now, the only problem with that is, once you've combined all of these different frequencies to say the particle is right here, well now you've started to lose all of the momentum information. It, it actually turns out that when you have one beautiful nice wave function, you can very beautifully define uh, what its velocity is. We know how to do that. But when you start combining all of these different wavelengths that all have different velocities or different frequencies or just different things depending on how you choose to add them up or what mediums you're dealing with. When you start adding all of this stuff together, um, suddenly you, you realize, 
I no longer know exactly what the momentum of this object is because there are simply limits on not my equipment, not my technique, but limits on what I'm able to come up with for the momentum based on all of these wave wavelengths combining together to tell me where the particle is. And I think this is a, a pretty common misunderstanding of this whole uncertainty principle is that it's it's not about the you know, you getting in and actually changing the position of the particle as you attempt to, to measure. It's not about a sensitivity of the instruments. There's actually a, it's impossible to, to actually do both at the same time. Right, and, and there, there is a certain amount of you're interfering with this, the process as you get involved. So, so there, there's two different ways that this gets looked at. One of the ways that it gets looked at is as a relationship between the energy of, of an object and the time at which you're looking at the energy. And, and so since um, when you measure the energy, well, you're interfering with the system and you're probably changing the energy of the system, you're either able to say very precisely what the energy is, but in the process of making the measurement, you lose the time due to all the general relativistic effects that have to take place and time and GR are not friendly together. Um, or you run into problems with you can measure the time that you're making the measurement very, very accurately, but in getting the time just so, you lose track of the energy. Um, it, it's pick one and there's a greater than sign in this. So the, the way the um, uncertainty principle is written is the accuracy with which you don't know the energy, the uncertainty, the indeterminacy, if you're speaking in German, of the energy multiplied by the uncertainty in the time of the measurement or the uh, indeterminacy in the time of the measurement multiplied together is always going to be greater than a amount that's set by quantum mechanics. Now, you can have more error than that. Um, it's perfectly reasonable to say my equipment doesn't work that well, my knowledge of the system isn't that great. My big fumbly but fingers keep knocking the particles around. Uh, right. right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. my Hadron Collider. Um, but, but once you put all those pieces together, you can't get better than um, you can't get better than a constant set by quantum mechanics. It's easier to understand this when you start looking at position and um, momentum. So we, we use momentum because you, you have issues with um, as your velocity changes, so does your mass, but mass and velocity play together in momentum. That, that's a variable that takes into account both of those properties. So here, you, you can actually start to imagine how you're affecting the system. If I want to know how fast something is going, the, the best way that I can do it in, in some ways is, is to actually measure how the impact of that object transfers its energy to another object. Well, I have now just completely changed where that particle is going to be because I have impacted it on something. Now, at the same time, I can very precisely know where a particle is by bouncing things from all directions off of it and, and looking to see, it, it's, it's sort of like how a scanning electron microscope works. You just bounce enough particles off of something, you know exactly where it is. But in the process of bouncing all these particles off of it, I have clearly changed its velocity. So in both of these types of measurements, by trying to get at one of the two variables, either the position or the momentum, I've affected my ability to know the other one. So since you need two different ways of measuring position and momentum, um, you can't get it both simultaneously with the same accuracy. And so what, do, what impact does this actually have on, on the actual particle itself? I mean, as you say, if you are colliding it into something, I guess you're ceasing its momentum. <laughs> Right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's one way to look at it. And, and um, discovering its location. But I mean, are you actually bonking the particle around through your measurements? Or is it, yeah. or, I guess, but I guess, you know, you've got this wave particle duality, right? You've got the situation where yeah. things like photons and stuff can act a bit like, like particles and a bit like waves. And in many cases, it's the act of measuring that forces the particle into one state or, or another. Is there some of that at play here? 
Yeah, that there's that some the of that like, sort of the quantum right. part of this is about. And and this is where actually when people first heard this, um, they got rather annoyed because it just seemed like it shouldn't make any sense. And Einstein, who really didn't like quantum mechanics at all, um, was one of the people that, that tried to say no. This, this, this doesn't work. Here's a thought experiment. Go, go look at this. I think this says it doesn't work. And so, so one of his thought experiments was to actually say, let's, let's consider a particle that's passing through that narrow slit. And by passing through the narrow slit, you're taking a, a wave function and causing it to bend and uh, distribute itself in a different way. We, we've all seen this with seawalls, or at least with pictures of seawalls, where you have this beautiful linear wave approaching the seawall, and then the part of the wave that passes through the hole in the seawall ends up rippling out as a curve. Well, he said that by, by considering a wave passing through a slit, you um, end up with, with uncertainty um, in the momentum that can be proportioned to the size of the slit, but you can determine the, the momentum that, that's introduced in this very accurately by just looking at, well, how does the wall recoil? So his idea was um, you get some of the information by looking at what passes through the slit, we know how to do that, and you get the rest of the information by looking at the wall's response to the parts of the wave that hit the wall. And, and Heisenberg, in thinking about this, pointed out that we don't actually know the wall's position and momentum with sufficient accuracy that we, we can just throw that out to get the wave perfectly. So once you start putting into consideration the, the um, uncertainty in our knowledge of the wall, that's where the uncertainty comes back into the problem and no, you can't use that sheet. Um, but Einstein was not deterred by this, and he kept coming up with new thought experiments. Well, what was his famous quote? He said, God does not play dice. Exactly, and he it turns out, well, like God yeah. may not. The universe certainly does. Yeah. Um, okay, so then I guess we should kind of take a step back a bit and sort of really understand how Heisenberg sort of formulated his original principle, and what exactly does, it, does his principle state? So, so his principle states that um, when he, he first wrote this, it, there was no um, detailing of constants. What, what his principle states is the uncertainty, and he actually used the word indeterminacy in his paper except in the final footnote, but when the paper, which was written in German, got translated into English, whoever did the translation took the word from the footnote and used it for the entire paper. So while the original paper mostly talks about the indeterminacy of the position and momentum, um, we've translated this in English into the uncertainty in position and momentum. It's semantics. semantics. Um, so, so what he discussed was the accuracy which with, with which we know a particle's position multiplied by the, I guess it's lack of accuracy is a better way to put it, the um, lack of accuracy with which we know its momentum. When you multiply these two things together, those two indeterminacies, those two uncertainties are always going to be greater than some set amount that is defined by the nature of the universe. He looked at the Planck constant. Um, since then, we've started using uh, the Planck constant um, divided by 2 pi divided by 2 because we like to divide things up. Um, but some form of the Planck constant is that limiting factor. And, and this all boils down to looking at the, the wavelength nature of things. And part of the, the inspiration for looking at this was the realization by Prince de Broglie, and I love the fact that you're getting royalty involved in the um, it, defining Not the musician, quantum mechanics. But, the actual, but an actual person. Right, yes. Um, he, he looked at the, the wave nature of things and realized it's not just light that has a wave nature. It's actually baseballs and human beings and everything that exists has 
a wave particle duality. And we've actually experimentally been able to prove this. You can take buckyball particles, um, little carbon molecules that I, I believe there are as many as, as 60 atoms involved in one of these crazy little molecules. You can take one of these, these carbon buckyballs and put it through a slit and then put a stream of them through a slit and they form the interference pattern that you would get from sending light through. Um, we can do this with electrons. There's a whole variety of experiments have been done showing that matter does behave, does self-interact in the same way that waves of light do. So de Broglie, in thinking about the wave nature of things, wa was able to describe the wavelength of an article as of, of a particle, rather, as being equal to the Planck constant h divided by the um, momentum of an object. Now, for a human being, yeah, our de Broglie wavelength yeah. is... Yeah, yeah. So, so our, our de Broglie wavelength is something like 10 to the minus 37 of a meter. Uh, so we're talking at like subatomic scales here for um, human beings' wavelengths. So we're not going to interact with one another going through doorways in quantum mechanic natures. Um, but the de Broglie wavelength starts to take on more and more importance as you start looking at fast-moving very small particles. And it was while Heisenberg was thinking about the wavelength nature of particles, while he was thinking about how particles interact with one another, how you measure different interactions, that he started to realize that it's this wavelength nature and our inability to say this is the center of a wave that means that we can never accurately know the position of a wave but if we do somehow look at the full wave packet, the combination of all those different wavelengths to see the particle nature of an electron, of a buckyball. Um, in doing that, we've removed the momentum information that we get from the wavelength. So it was just in looking at how do we measure these two different things, what aspects of the objects do we rely on, that he realized, crud, we can't get perfect accuracy. And so what are the implications then of the uncertainty principle in just sort of modern engineering, modern physics? I mean, it does, this is one of those principles that actually does have an implication in electronics and stuff, right? Well, it, it does, and it, it runs into annoying things where um, we, we actually can't completely localize particles um, with CCD detectors and such, where uh, when, when we have, or the time, you pick one. So if you're doing extremely high speed photon counting, you can either know exactly where the photon hit your detec detector or exactly when the photon hit your detector. You can't know both. Wow. Um, so, so, so I think about how this then um, affects things like, well, there's faster than light pesky neutrinos that, that were or were not, and I'm on the were not oh. detected yeah, side yeah. of things. So you can either know the exactly when or the exactly where, but there's always this uncertainty involved, and you have to start taking it into account on, well, you can't know exactly where the detector was exactly, you can't know exactly where the neutrino was exactly, you don't know the times and energies exactly, there's always this fuzz to everything. And right, and so you've got a situation where you've got these particles... I guess that you know you're dealing with the speed of light, and so the distances yeah. they're traveling is relatively short. I mean, you're looking at from one part of Switzerland to France, right? So you don't right. have a big long distance, and you can't and you, and you can know the distance, and you can know where these particles are hitting, which I guess is key for the neutrinos. But it's that timing which tells you whether they're moving faster than the speed of light that is really hard to get your kid a handle on. So you can see how that, yeah. that's rearing its head with that recent discovery of fast and light neutrinos. That's really and, cool. And there, and, and there, honestly, I think a lot of the problems are in, are in timing. I mean, one of the, the issues that comes out of general relativity is um, how do you link clocks? And this was 
actually one of the um, thought experiments that Einstein came up with, sort of, kind of. One of the things that he said, referring to the uncertainty principle um, in, in his other, no, this can't work argument, was consider you have a box with a clock, and you very precisely um, time the opening and closing of a door on the box, and you let a certain amount of energy out of the box, and you have the ability to measure the amount of energy that came out, and then you can weigh the box so you know the amount of energy inside, and, and it's through this combination of measuring the amount of energy that leaves and measuring the weight of the box after and knowing the moment that the energy moved well, that's a delta E from knowing how much energy came out. That's a delta T from the clock. You should be able to get all of this perfectly accurately just by, we just by weighing the box. And it was pointed out that the clock and the box are gravitationally tied together and that this is a gravitational field that will thus affect the ticking of the clock. And... <sighs> In the cha yeah, and, and so it's all tangled together, and so now the uncertainty in the time is also coming from relativity playing a role, and it's, it's all part of a whole. And at the end of the day, it means that even if we do know where every particle in the universe is, we don't know where they're going, and we can't predict the future. But I think that's a fantastic example, because Einstein coming up with a, uh, with a thought experiment, yeah. and then someone says, oh, but don't forget this little theory called general relativity, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's going to impact the experiment as well. And yeah. I'm sure, again, he was really pleased at that, at that example and had to go back to the drawing board. But he clearly yeah. was deeply puzzled and bothered by the implications of this of this theory, because uh, yeah, as he said, you know he went on record a bunch of times and spent a lot of his final years attempting to come up with a you know a theory of everything and trying to I, I yeah. know think through the implications of quantum mechanics and gravity and and all of that together and right. you know, every for every thought experiment that he delivered the uncertainty principle had a perfectly, go away. perfectly fine way to explain how that still was under the constraints of the uncertainty principle. It's, yeah. it's quite interesting that the, you know, essentially the most brilliant scientist of, in modern times just kept bashing his head against this principle, yeah. and it kept defeating him. Yeah, and it really does say that the scientific, scientific method does work, that it's not always a cult of personality. That does have to do occasionally need to just wait for somebody to die for a theory to get accepted. But to, to have someone with the notoriety of Einstein going, no, really, let's, let's think this through, and if you're going, no, Einstein, <laughs> this is right, yeah. it's, it's, just, it's just a brilliant way that the entire community together can be smarter than any one individual when it comes to figuring out what's true and what's not. That is, that is really great. Um, so then, you know, does the uncertainty principle have any impact, for example, on those, the, you know, the search for the Higgs boson, some of these great big particle colliders, because I'm sure they're attempting to measure particles very carefully. Right. So, so here, luckily, we're mostly interested in the energies of the particles. So we're looking for the tracks, the light being emitted, the um, basically what is the energy of each of these little things that gets created. And, and so while decay times are kind of awesome to know, um, it's, it's knowing what is the energy of the objects that are decaying that is of the most import to us. So um, while it's annoying that we can't know everything, just being able to get at the energy is 125 giga electron volts per C squared. That is the information that's mostly important to us here. Right, but you can imagine you've got these cascades of particles that, yeah. that have half-lives of certain periods, and so knowing that this particle collapsed into those particles and released this energy at this time periods, that is starting to fall under that, that whole uncertainty principle. It, it's not, luckily it's not the dominant problem. The, the dominant problem is just getting all the energy in one place at one time um, and letting all of those decays happen. That's really cool. All right. Well, I think, we're, uh, I think we're all done this week. So thanks a lot, Pamela. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. All right, we'll see and, uh, you.
Oh, was that something else? I, I was going to say, and uh, I will hopefully see you soon. And don't forget, if you're interested in figuring out a Christmas vacation next year, oh, right. we're going to be on the World Is Not Ending cruise. And I'm just going to keep plugging that periodically yeah. so that we can all, all of you out there listening, hopefully meet in person and explore Mayan ruins together. Well, we'll plug it until it fills up, and then we won't plug it anymore. But yeah. Yeah, that's, that's um, true. Yeah, and so that's, uh, yeah, and that's going to be over the... Uh, December 21st holiday <laughs> into the world. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so you can go to cosmoquest.org slash... No, Astrosphere. It was Astrosphere. Astrosphere. Go to Astrosphere. It's on the homepage, astrosphere.org. Yeah, astrosphere.org, and there's more information on it. All right, well, thanks again, Pamela, and we'll see you next week. Sounds great. Talk to you later. Now, all the rest of you, don't leave. We're just going to save, and then we're going to take your questions. Save. This was an saved. example of sometimes physics just isn't as exciting to span into 30 minutes as, as one would hope. I but it was awesome. when you teach it, it ends up being an entire week of math on the chalkboard. So it's much more pleasant oh, really? to do it here in audio. Yeah. Because there's um, all the deriving of where did all of these crazy terms come from. That is really cool. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> so there's a joke in the comments. So Trev Worth uh, posts, uh, Werner Heisenberg was pulled over by the police. Do you know how fast you were going, sir? And the officer asked, no, reply Heisenberg, but I know exactly where I am. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, well, I will, uh, again, like I said, we did this at the last minute, and so, you know, I'm not sure how many people are, are watching. If Who everyone can in? plus one so we know how many of you there are, that would yeah. be fabulous. Uh, and so I'll post a link to the Hangout. So if uh, people want to join, I can see Trev is watching. Love to know how Trev's experience with uh, Jerry Ryan did a, a live Hangout yesterday. It's pretty cool. Uh, so if anybody has any questions about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle or astronomy in general or math, physics, uh, anything you want, we'll... Uh, We'll pose these questions to Pamela. You can either post these questions in the comments uh, in the, on the Google Plus page. You can send them to Twitter by, by putting it in hashtag Hangouts, hashtag CQX, and uh, we'll be watching the Twitters to see if there's any questions there. Uh, we will uh, also, if anyone has a question for Pamela and wants to jump into the Hangout, I've posted a link into the Google Plus, uh, into the Google Plus page, and you can, you can see that there. Uh, ideally, you've got video and, uh, and audio so that we can see and hear you. Um, and so we've got Gordon Clay has just joined us. Hi, Gordon. Can you hear us? <laughs> I can love that dog <laughs> picture. That dog is awesome. Can you type at us, Gordon? You can always put something into the group chat. So, um, Awesome. All right. Let me see if there are any, any more questions. More Heisenberg and certain DEA principal jokes. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's another one. The, the Heineken uncertainty principle says, you can never be sure how many beers you had last night. That's from Dave Finn. That is awesome. Uh, so Johnny Bo Anderson asks, uh, actually, question for you, Pamela. Which observatories have you been observing at, and which one had the largest mirror? So, so the largest obser observatory I've, I've ever got the chance to use is actually the Hobby Everly Telescope at McDonald's Observatory. It's a little over nine m meters uh, usable surface area. Um, I've also, the first observatory I got to work at during research was the six meter in the Soviet Union when it was the Soviet Union. I was actually there when Yeltsin was elected. I, it was an interesting time to be 17 in a foreign country as a foreign exchange student. Um, so I, I've used the six meter in the Soviet Union at the Special Astronomical Observatory. I've been observing at Kitt Peak using the Schmidt, te Schmidt Telescope. I've used uh, data from the VLA while working at Haystack Observatory. Um, and I've spent hours and hours and hours and hours at McDonald Observatory on the 107 inch and 30 inch telescopes. Have you done any work with the Hubble Space Telescope? Um, I've, I've utilized data from the mission, and I have a bunch of ongoing projects that use the Hubble Space Telescope, but I have not been the originator of an idea that got time. I have been one of the minions on an idea that got time. Yeah, but I think that's that, okay. I think Phil Plate has been 
has been like one of the helpers for uh, for some of that stuff as well on some super yeah. research. Yeah. Um, all right, and You're we've got. You're only allowed so many good ideas. Yeah. Um, so we've been joined by Dave Finn and Trev Trev Worth. Hey, Trev. Hi, Dave. Hey, Dave. Good. So uh, so Gordon, uh, you had a question. Gordon Clay has joined us, but has no camera, has no microphone, which he will uh, rectify for next week. Right, Gordon? Um, but you asked a question, uh, what kind of work is Pamela currently doing? So Pamela, what are you currently working on? Oh, right now I, I have to admit that I'm, I'm basically a digital instrumentationalist. Um, I'm working with the CosmoQuest project to write the software that allows a variety of different scientists to come to us with image data and we've defined a set of tools that people like all of you out in the audience can use to annotate that image data and we're putting together projects for, well we have Moon Mappers up which is for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, we have a project coming for Mercury Messenger. We have a project coming for the Dawn mission looking at asteroid Vesta. Uh, we have a project coming for New Horizons that uses ground-based data to search for Kuiper Belt objects and we're going to be working with the Hubble Space Telescope to look at anything in the solar system the Hubble Space Telescope's looked at. And the idea behind all of these projects is we're working with teams of scientists who have very specific scientific tasks they need done um, and they needed a uniform tool set to do it with and it turned out all of them can use the same tool set. So I'm currently along with Corey Lehan who's my lead programmer building that tool set and we also have Joe Moore, Sean McKenney, a whole group of people and we're doing all of this open source. So if you're hearing this and going, that's cool, how do I get involved? Um, go over to the CosmoQuest forums and um, we're a very small underworked staff and we're more than, help, more than happy to have your help to develop new tools for scientists. There you go. So we're trying. So I'm an instrument builder. You, well, yeah, but you are you are bringing together the general public and scientists yeah. to help bring you know many hands make light work, and so scientists have all of these these discoveries that they're trying to make. Where going through the data is the kind of thing that's not good for a computer, but it's very you know very easy for a human being. And so there's this there's this match where we're trying to you know, where you're trying to help regular yeah. folks participate in scientific projects. Moon Mappers is a, is a great example of that right now. All right. And uh, Bart's just joined us. Hi, Bart. It's gone dark. <laughs> um, all right. So did anyone else have a question for us? There's no question. Let me see if there's any more questions. Bart has his hand up. Oh, go ahead, Bart. Uh, Pamela, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, you said you were a programmer, so uh, I'm uh, wondering what kind of programming environment do you like to use? So I, I have to admit I'm old school and I'm going to mute you because I can hear myself echoing on you and I'll unmute you. Um, okay. Oh, I just muted myself, that was wrong. But you muted yourself, so that worked. Um, Okay, so, so I'm, I'm old school. I actually studied computer science while I was at Michigan State working on Unix systems, VI, and command line, and I never thoroughly outgrew that. So I, I tend to, um, when I need 30 windows to work on all the code, I'm in TextMate um, using various SVN tools to push code back and forth. Um, but there's a whole lot of the, dang it, I need to do something small and fast, and I just SSH in VI, whatever I need to fix, and quickly S SVN it so that I don't lose anything in the process. Um, but mostly it's either um, using TextMate uh, through some sort of a client um, combined with SVN or it's just old school VI and an SSH through a terminal window. Um, it's, it's, I hate Eclipse. I, I do not have enough language to say how much I hate Eclipse. Yeah. Well, you know, the, um, funny, the funny thing as well is that me as the publisher of Universe Today, my day almost looks exactly the same, which is that I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm managing, you know, Unix, Linux boxes. I'm, I'm, you know, dealing with, I'm writing code. I'm popping into VI. I'm changing configuration files. And I actually went back and got my computer science degree just to be able to publish the web, the website, to yeah. be able to handle the scale of the traffic. So it's a, it's a funny thing how, 
you really kind of have to be a computer person first and then whatever it is that you normally do to just try and even survive in this new world. And, and all the research that I did in undergraduate and graduate school was all very computer intensive where I've always been working with a ton of data where you have to be doing basically database programming or programming involving lots and lots of text files back in the days before MySQL. And, and so it was a very natural progression to go from writing software to handle, uh, bringing in the first survey, the NVSS survey, these are radio surveys, and integrating those surveys with optical surveys. Um, it's, it's a very similar programming task to go from doing that to writing uh, database programs that manipulate all of the data coming in from citizen scientists. And for those of you who want to know language information, um, I, I am someone who does when it needs to be really computationally careful, it's C. Um, and the rest of the time, I'm a LAMP stack kind of girl running Linux Ubuntu servers on the Amazon cloud with RDS containing MySQL. We're using S3 for storage. Um, PHP and JavaScript, HTML5 are how all of the stuff gets displayed. And my main programming role within CosmoQuest is I'm the interface developer. So if the UI sucks, I'm the person you blame. It de definitely takes a lot of being jack of all trades. I mean, yeah. you know, at this point now, I mean, I know about, I know with Pamela, I mean, you can do audio, and you can do audio editing, and you can do <laughs> graphics, and you can do coding, and you can do, you know, and writing, and management, and every piece of the puzzle, and in many cases, you know, the big challenge that we've been facing now is how to do video, and we're figuring that yeah. out, and that's the new suite of sort of capability that we're adding to our plate, mostly just out of necessity, you know, mm -hmm. in this new world. It's not like there's a lot of money, and so we have to learn this stuff on our own, just through our own hard work and just trying stuff out. You know, you're watching our, us experiment with this new medium in real time, every screw-up that we make. Yeah. And that's just the, the reality of it. And so it's live. It's, it's all live, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think of as one takeaway that y anyone who's watching this should really think about is just don't wait for permission. Just get just cracking. Do just do it. Just, you know, and you start to, you know you're starting to make an impact when people start to complain. That's, you know, I've, hilariously, I've had people complain about these virtual star parties that we're doing, which is really funny to me, you know, which is, you know, like, like we're looking up telescopes at Google Plus and watching, looking at Venus and Saturn and Jupiter live, and, you know, as soon as someone goes, well, why are you guys doing that? Someone's already done that. Well, that's, you know, then I know, then, then yeah. I know it's really cool, and we've really <laughs> crossed some line, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, it, you know, I mean, and that's it. I mean, you don't know how, what it's going to take until you just get cracking and, and try to do this kind of stuff. And you and, learn and every little piece of the puzzle. And, and you know that you're passionate about what you're doing when you have the, I'm annoyed with my code, I'm going to spend all day Saturday until 4 a.m. because there's that one last bug that won't die. Um, creating something like the, the Google Hangout software that we have that you can get via GitHub, um, that came out of the, dang it, I hate having to scroll all the way down the comment list on the Hangout page. I hate not knowing the URL ahead of time. I can solve this. So <laughs> if you have that sort of, I'm annoyed by something, I'm going to program a solution, you're the type of person we like to play with. Yeah, and Google and Google Plus has been a great uh, yeah. environment for this because Google, the Google folks themselves, have been really open and interactive with us, and you know they often watch uh, some of the hangouts we do and help promote them, and uh, and so it's it's a really good environment to test out this kind of stuff. If you can help push this this whole environment forward, I, I know they really love it. And, so and their API is easy to use. Yeah. Now, so did anyone else in the in the hangout have a question for us, Dave? Trev. You can geek at us. We're good with that. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a question for us? More Heisenberg uh, jokes? <laughs> no, I just say, I uh, apologize in advance for that one. I, uh, it's not the best of jokes, but it had to be told, didn't it? You know, it's, <laughs> it's a joke that I know, and it was <laughs> appropriate. So, um, it, it was yeah. perfect. It was absolutely <laughs> perfect. <laughs> I don't think that there's any such thing as a good Heisenberg joke. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think with Heisenberg jokes, you tell them and see who smiles, and, and then you know who gets in, who doesn't. That's, I think that's that's what they're for, rather than make people laugh, aren't they? Just to see who knows, knows a little bit about physics. 
So, yeah. <laughs> it's a nerd cred joke. Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. Um, so Shyam Nambir asked, uh, is it possible to know how much energy or momentum the observing wave or photon has contributed to the observed quantity so that by subtraction we can get a better observation? You can get either the momentum and energy out of that or you can get the time and position. You can't get both. So, so the un uncertainty principle holds its firm grasp on not letting you know everything at once. So, so collisions in particular are very good at telling you what was the energy involved, what was the momentum involved, not so good at telling you the time and position information. Um. There's another question there, too. Uh, oh, uh, Scott Lewis wants to know, are we familiar with the Boink or at-home projects, and is there any way that Lehman can truly add into the research of modern physics? So the Boink projects are things like SETI at home, Einstein at home. Um, at home. There's, there's a climate prediction one that I don't remember the name of. Um, all of these are different projects that allow you to install software on your computer. And then the software goes out and grabs chunks of data, processes the chunk of data, and sends the information back to the scientist. So the idea is that in the downtime when your computer has a screensaver turned on, that downtime is actually getting used to process scientific data. And if just three people do this for eight hours a day while they're nominally asleep, um, that's one computer a scientist doesn't have to purchase. So if you think of every three people's dedicated sleep time is saving a researcher a couple thousand dollars, um, this can build up to huge savings. And Boink has a whole variety of different projects that allow you to spend five minutes installing, acknowledge you're going to be paying for the electricity, paying for the bandwidth, but other than that, you just let your computer go, and you're contributing to science entirely passively. Now, there's a whole variety of other non-passive projects out there that range from going out with telescopes and making observations for things like transitsearch.org, the Center for uh, Backyard Astrophysics, the uh, Center for, Small, for Minor Planets, uh, the American Association of Variable Star Observers, on and on and on. There's, there's all sorts of things that you can do observationally with a telescope. And then, of course, there's, there's projects like we're working on with moon mappers, and there's others out there. There's Folded at Home that does proteins. Um, I think all of us took our inspiration from Stardust at Home. Um, all of our projects are, are geared at you're sitting on your sofa, you're kind of bored. Don't play Angry Birds. Instead, do science. Yeah, and it comes from that basic, our basic belief that that there's lots of people out there who would love to contribute to science, but they don't want to take the 15 years it's going to take to get a PhD. But in many cases, they can contribute. There's just on very specific tasks that human beings are really good at and computers are really bad at. And so I think the big difference is with what, like, folding at home and those. They really just want you for your computer resources. But, but I think CosmoQuest we really want you for your mind. Yeah, we're, we're working to um, figure out how to add classes over time, and we're talking with people like the Catalina Sky Survey who are taking images and they need skilled people to then look at it and be able to effectively say, this was a supernova, this was a variable star, this was the telescope screwed up. Um, so we're building towards having these more and more complicated projects in the future. So it's not just clicking. Um, the Dawn mission project that we're working on is actually quite a challenge. When I first looked at it, I had this, oh God, I don't understand this moment, because we're going to be doing topographic maps of an asteroid. We're, we're going to be asking you to mark where are the crest lines, where are the troughs, where are all of these different features that we need to understand to try and figure out what the heck happened to this very bizarre asteroid. So we're going to be teaching you the geophysics I apparently don't know right now. Um, and we're all going to be learning it together so we can do these amazing scientific projects. All right. So did anyone else have a question? I think we're kind of running to the end of the, uh, of the hour at this point. So I've got a, um, I've got, 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 it's, not, it's not related to what we're talking about, but um, we're going to ask you about, I've asked you already, uh, uh, Fraser, actually, but uh, you may know further now. You know anything more about Tam? In what way? Ticket sales base. Do you know when they when come out? Tickets, because they're not for sale, are they? 
The tickets for Wait, TAM? I have no idea. Oh, The Amazing I, Meeting in Las Vegas, or is it... Yeah. Um, I don't know, but I agreed to be a speaker yesterday. Oh, did you? Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so there you go. So Pamela's going to be... I the dates. <laughs> So Pamela is going to be speaking at the amazing meeting, and uh, that is all we know. Right. Are you so you're still going? I'm thinking of it. Right. You know, it's one of those things where I have to figure out the finances and uh, and convince the family to, to let me disappear <laughs> for a little while. Although my wife love would love to come to Tam. She has a huge crush on Penn Gillette, so. Oh, it's Pamela. Is he usually? Not always. Um, mm. He he was. There very briefly last year and hosted a amazingly insane after hours party um, that involved strippers and science and somehow it worked and I just hoped no one took photos of me with strippers in the background um, but it was a Gillette party and um, the the Three years ago, when I wasn't there, he was apparently there. And two years ago, he wasn't there at all. It, it all depends. He's so busy. He's doing the radio show. He's going to be on the new uh, Trump Celebrity Apprentice. So it, it's all going to depend on what his schedule is. Yeah. So I'd love to come. Everyone, everyone leans on me to come every year. So hopefully I'll be able to make it this year. But I'm actually, as I mentioned, I'm coming to your neck of the woods in about yeah, a month and a half. Nice. Yeah, I'm going to be coming to Europe, actually, in uh, going to Amsterdam, Paris, and London uh, at the end of March for about three weeks to right, my okay. family. So it's sort of mostly pleasure, but we're going to try and coordinate some meetups in each of those cities. So. Sweet. There you go. There you go. Yeah, I can't wait if you're doing a, doing a hill, then. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. All right, well, I think I'm going to wrap this up then. So uh, it was good to... See everybody. Thanks again, Pamela, for recording. Thanks to everybody who, uh, who participated. And we will uh, see you guys all next, I guess on Monday, so uh, is when we're going to record next. And we'll then be ahead of time, a week ahead of time. What, what and time Nancy's do doing do? that tomorrow. That's what, right, yeah. What time do you guys uh, usually do this? We do this usually on um, Mondays at uh, noon. Okay. Noon Pacific, Pacific which is 3 a.m. Yeah, that's, that's my next question. Yeah. Yeah, 8 GMT, 5 a.m. Sydney. All of these times of events that I know of get posted on the CosmoQuest blog every Friday. So sometime Friday afternoon, I'll be putting out a week's event calendar. And if any of you are out there and have global events of some sort, I'm happy to include them in our calendar. We're trying to distribute all the astronomy things that people can get engaged in. So just let us know what we have, and I'll include it in that blog post. Yeah, so right now we're doing uh, Mondays. We do Monday at noon, we do Astronomy Cast live at, at noon Pacific, 3 Eastern. Um, and then on Wednesdays, was that right, Pamela? You're doing at 4 p.m. Pacific? Pacific, yeah. 7 Eastern, midnight London, 11 a.m. Sydney. Yeah. We're doing a weekly astronomy hour. Then Thursdays we have the Space Hangout at 10 Pacific, 1 Eastern, 6 London, 5 a.m. Sydney. We're sorry, Sydney. Yeah. Um, and we also and, randomly and then, do virtual uh, star parties where I'm we're right. connecting up telescopes. And we're going to try and settle on, a, on an actual specific time, but right now it's really all dependent on the astronomer. So a lot of times an astronomer contacts me and says, okay, I've got clear skies, I'm going to set up my telescope. And then I say, okay, and then, then we go is there, is, is there a link where a lot of this stuff is posted? Because usually I don't find out until I, I, I get like an email uh, from Google Plus saying that you're starting a hangout in 10 minutes or something like that. So, so there are two places to look. One is the CosmoQuest.org blog. So CosmoQuest.org slash B-L-O-G, all lowercase. Okay. Um, I put up a weekly post of all of our activities, and I'll update that post as I need to. Um, then there's also a calendar on CosmoQuest. It's in the main toolbar. So if you look at that calendar, you can subscribe to any of our different Google calendars via that. And as events come up, I update that calendar. I've updated it three times today. The big plan is for us to also put together an email list, so and even SMS if people want that, and so they can get a they get an email or a text message when we're about to start something. And that'll we, be good. We will make you pay for SMS because I don't have that budget, but yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, but but definitely email. So you can get an email an hour before the yeah. show is going to happen, and then you'll get a you'll get a warning. So so that's still got that sort of half built at this point, and and so we'll be able to implement that pretty soon. So we'll get and then people can sign up to that and then get a, a notification because email is really the best way that, to yeah. to tell people that things are happening. So. Cool. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap this up. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks for listening. Uh, and we will see you guys on, on Monday. Thank you all. Bye.